Hello everyone and welcome to this video presentation today on selective soldering nozzles, insights into wear and future developments. I am Dr. Sam McMaster from Pillar House International and I'm going to be talking about the technical work that we've done to develop our new innovative selective soldering nozzles. This work was done in collaboration with Coventry University and the slides you're going to see here today were originally presented at the Apex 2023 Technical Conference and you will see a modified version of those slides to make them more optimal for this video presentation. I'm going to talk briefly through the overview. We're going to talk about the current technology that is used for selective soldering nozzles, talk about the wear and wettability that uh, is key to selective soldering operation, talk through the tests and methodologies that we've developed for measuring selective solder wear, and look at the results that we've gained from our current nozzles as well as new materials and then finally talk about what this means from a technical point of view and also from a commercial point of view. So what you'll see here is a photograph of a selective soldering nozzle with its inertia shroud at the bottom. So this is used to keep an oxide layer from forming on the outside of the nozzle and what you'll see is a nice shiny tin layer this is the, from the solder that has adhered to the nozzle. It's still in liquid forms. This photograph was taken quite soon after the solder flow was stopped. Around the circumference of the nozzle, we require the solder to wet all around this so that we get a nice radial wave. And this is what gives us control during the selective soldering process. So let's review some terminology so that we're all thinking about the same things when I talk through some of the technical terms that I'm going to discuss later in this presentation. In terms of wettability, we're talking about the ability of a liquid to spread out on a solid surface. So there are two things that underpins this. The surface tension of the liquid as the force that would normally pull a liquid droplet into a sphere, but this would then be the force that would resist it spreading out when it's on a solid surface. And that solid surface has what's called a defined surface free energy. So this is the result of the various different bonds that are on the top of a surface. And in terms of wettability, we're analyzing the interaction of that surface tension and that surface free energy. And that will define how much a liquid droplet will spread out on a surface. We have some diagrams here showing different contact angles, which is the metric that we can use to determine uh, how well a surface wets or how well a liquid wets to a surface. So we have our very large contact angle and this shows a very poor wetting scenario. And then our two low contact angles are showing when the wettability is good. The liquid droplet can spread out more on a surface and therefore you measure a very low contact angle. And in terms of solder on a nozzle, if we had a static system, this is what we would look for. Very good wettability and a low contact angle, which we'll discuss later. Let's discuss the current nozzle technology employed by both Pillar House and the other companies operating in the sphere of selective soldering. Generally, a lot of these nozzles will use a ferrous base material with different electroplated coatings on the outside. These are generally used to aid initial wettability Sometimes these are quoted as adding lifetime to the nozzle, but as we'll discuss later, the electroplated coatings are too thin to provide much of a lifetime benefit to the nozzles. So they instead just serve to aid the initial wettability, to have a tin layer on the outside of the nozzles so that when the solder meets that tin layer, it will form just one layer of tin that will then flow off the nozzle. Pillar House will typically use uh, an electroplated layer of approximately 20 microns of copper and 20 microns of tin. But this is for the old nozzles. The new nozzles will use a slightly different design. But wetting nozzles are not the only type of selective soldering apparatus that exists. There's also non-wetting nozzles. So when we're using a material's ability to resist a liquid spreading out on it. So instead, this would use a material like titanium to constrict a liquid to a fixed volume or a cutout of a particular shape to fit to an array of pins on a PCB. So now let's take a look at some of these selective soldering apparatus. So what you can see here is one of the wetted 
uh, solder nozzles. So with this, we can see that radial wave that I spoke about earlier. It has uh, wetting all around the circumference of the nozzle, giving us a nice dome shape for the solder. So this is great for control during the selective soldering process. It allows us to move in both dips, where we move up to a, an individual pin or a close array of pins, or draw step along a row of pins. If you have one of these nozzles that does not wet well, as we can see next to it, the solder will form a single stream. So in this case, the surface energy of the solid is not enough to overcome the surface tension of the solder, and so it wants to just form a single stream. And this is very poor for control. In this case, the surface tension is actually so high, you could take something like a screwdriver and actually push the stream of solder around uh, the circumference of the nozzle, which is very bad for controlled soldering. What we can also see below is one of the non-wetting apparatus. So this has a specific cutout shape. It's formed of titanium, and these fats, if you will, are filled up with solder. And this will then move up to an array of pins in a single dip process. This is great if you have a very high volume of PCBs, but it's not taking advantage of the flexibility of a wetted nozzle that would generally be used in selective soldering. So now let's look at the methodologies that we've used during this project. We are now at a stage of final prototypes and almost ready to go into full production of our new nozzles, but we started quite humbly by looking at materials that were already used in the electronics industry, starting with the iron of the current nozzles, and then moving on to various other materials that you would find on printed circuit boards. We would then look for compatibility of these materials, think about their wear properties and their thermal stability. We could then look at different coating methods and different uh, surface modification methods in order to modify those materials, improve their performance. We could then look at compatibility tests, so things like dip testing, and then move on to more rigorous wear testing, which I will talk about later in this presentation. Once we have wear testing, we would then test the wettability in this static form, as I mentioned earlier, and I will talk about more later. We were then able to determine several designs and have now settled on a final design. So this has been sent out to a few select customers for prototype testing, and we will soon be putting this into production. So now let's dive deeper into the wear of these selective soldering nozzles, starting first with the dip testing that I mentioned previously. So we would use this because it would allow us to very quickly evaluate materials for their compatibility as a nozzle, and to look at how well they would interface with solder in a bath. So we would get a sample of material and immerse that in solder for 10 to 15 seconds, which would allow the material to heat up and would allow the solder to begin to interface with the material if it allows it to wet. We can then withdraw that and analyze the surface to see, okay, is the solder wetting to this? If so, it is a material that we would then evaluate further. We would then move on to more rigorous wear testing and take samples of this material, form it into a nozzle shape so we could then look at the mass loss over time, which I'll discuss more later. But if wetting occurs on a nozzle, we would then eventually begin to see mass loss from that nozzle, giving us evidence that there is some underpinning chemistry between the solder and the nozzle. Mechanical properties did not feature as a controlling element in the wear of these nozzles. So if we have a non-wetting nozzle or a material that doesn't wet completely, we would actually see what we have on this slide, which are de-wetting patterns. So this would occur when the solder cannot form a good interface with the nozzle material and would instead begin to withdraw from the surface. So this can happen in various patterns, the technicalities of which aren't necessarily important to this study, but if you are looking into different soldering materials, you will notice patterns like this, like voiding, dendritic uh, formations of the liquid, wherein the film of solder is not stable on the surface and it will begin to withdraw. This is the effect of the surface tension that I talked about before, where it will want to pull back and to form a low energy shape. So what does a worn selective soldering nozzle look like? What we can see here 
is a nozzle that has been tested up to 200 hours. So at this point, we can see that there's been a lot of material lost from the surface. The radius that was once on top of the nozzle has become sharp, and the solar wave eventually becomes unstable. So this is the point that we could then use to determine geometrically when the nozzle would no longer function. So this would give us a metric that we would then later use in order to determine the maximum lifetime of our other materials. So now we know what a worn nozzle looks like, let's talk about the methods that we determine to measure the wear of these nozzles. We settled on mass loss as a standardized method to measure the wear of the nozzles. So we would take a nozzle, weigh it, and dimension it, so using things like the internal diameter and the height of the nozzle, and then install it into a machine. We initially started with quite low time steps, so eight hours run it over the course of a full day, but later determined that longer time steps once per day, so running it 24 hours, was a better methodology uh, in terms of time steps, as that eliminates some of the variance that you find with these materials. We would stop the test once per day, extract the nozzle from the machine, allow it to cool down, measure its dimensions, and mass. And we would then calculate a normalized percentage mass loss. So this is much better because it allows you to compare different materials quite readily against each other, and also different nozzle types. In the past, we've seen people do things like look at a dissolution thickness, as we see here the diagram at the bottom. This is where a large solder drop will be placed on a material, and then they would cut into the material and analyze this with an electron microscope. This is quite difficult to achieve because it requires cross-sectioning to be done with the same process every time, and it's very poorly defined in terms of dimensions, whereas mass loss gets rid of all of that, and we instead have just one metric that we can use and with repeat tests, we can have results with very low error. So now let's look at the link to wettability that we have with the wear of nozzles. In various pieces of published literature, and also in the IPC standards, we have discussions of the wear of nozzles referred to as erosion, which, for anyone who is not versed in the study of wear of materials, this would seem fine, as it's a progressive loss of mass. But in terms of tribology, which is the study of the wear of materials, this refers to a very specific wear type, that being loss of material due to impingement of solid particles, and also liquid flow, but this doesn't fully cover the wear of selective soldering nozzles. As I mentioned before, there is this compatibility that we need to deal with, this chemical reaction that occurs between the solder and the nozzle. So we know that it's more than simple erosion. And now instead, we need to think about this in terms of chemistry. And there have been some published papers that have looked at wettability between solder and materials in terms of reaction. This is called reactive wetting. And what we can have with this type of wetting is a modification of the geometry. So we could form a reaction layer or dissolve some of the material by the solder interfacing with that material and then modifying the contact that it's sitting in. Or we can have that quite slight where it doesn't appear to have modified the geometry at all. But nonetheless, there is some chemistry that underpins this reaction. So now that we know that there is some chemistry that underpins the reaction between the solder and the nozzle, we need to conduct more research in order to investigate this reactive wetting the intermetallic formation, which is this reactive layer that I talked about, and the modification of the nozzle geometry, and also look at the impact of flow speed and other flow parameters into the wear of the nozzles. So we can say that there is quite a complex wear mechanism that is happening. So let's look at the mass loss results for our standard nozzle now. So this is iron-based with the 20 microns each, of copper and tin electroplated coatings. So as you can see really early in the test, we have a period of mass gain. This is due to the solder adhering to the nozzle. You can also see in this early part of the test is that the time steps for measurements are quite close together. 
So this is at the point when we were measuring over the period of a standard workday, eight hours, and later we moved on to measuring this 24 hours. So running the nozzle continuously and stopping it once per day and then taking measurements. So this allowed us to control some of the variability that we get with this testing. And we would then repeat the test at least three times in order to reduce the variance and reduce the error that is quite inherent in this type of testing. So now we've analyzed the wear of nozzles with solder flowing through them, but we became curious as to what happens when the nozzles are simply immersed in static solder, so no movement at all. So with this type of testing, we determined that longer time periods, again, would be better. So measuring once per week, that is 168 hours between each measurement. So the nozzles were placed in different baths. One was fluxed daily, and then the other one was placed in a bath with no flux applied to the nozzle. So what we can see in both cases is mass gain for these nozzles, but the nozzle that had flux applied to it gained far more mass than the other nozzle. And we suppose this is due to the flux's cleaning effect, removing any dirt from the nozzle, any dross, and allowing more solder to adhere to it and possibly form a reaction layer on the surface. So now we've determined that static tests only result in mass gain for nozzles. We wanted to look at different coatings and to analyze if these could extend the lifetime of the nozzles instead of simply being a wettability aid. So we looked first to precious metals, which are already used in the microelectronics industry. They're known for their solderability. So we took copper nozzles, which we knew would dissolve very readily in the, in the solder. So we could measure the time for which that nozzle would dissolve. And then we could look at the time for each of the coated nozzles to dissolve, to analyze very quickly if these coatings would benefit the nozzle and give us a significant lifetime increase. So we looked at precious metals for this, palladium, ruthenium, rhodium, and platinum, each one of those with approximately five microns of electroplated nickel, a gold flash, and then one to two microns of the precious metal itself. So now let's analyze the results of these tests. So what we can see is that the copper nozzles had a very fast dissolution time of approximately 150 minutes, normally, we know our iron nozzles would last about 200 hours, so you can tell immediately the difference in these materials. However, our new precious metal platings on the copper only resulted in a maximum lifetime gain of up to 240 minutes, which is very poor. It's approximately a 30% increase on the copper, so we very quickly determined that materials known for the solderability would in fact wear far too quickly and further cementing our link between the wetting and wear of the nozzles. So we knew that we would have to analyze different materials in order to find our answer. So now we can look at the lifetime results that we get from our new materials. So we looked at various iron-based alloys, steels, and different surface treatments in order to prolong the life of the nozzles. So as we can see, that horizontal line at minus 17% mass loss gives us our maximum lifetime. So that's at the point where the nozzle can no longer geometrically support the solder wave on it. So that's what we determine as our maximum lifetime. What you see are the linear fits of the materials tested. This is the result of three repeats for each material. And we can see that we were able to attain up to a 1500% increase in lifetime of the nozzle materials. This is a massive gain versus what we have with the iron nozzles, which is approximately 220 hours of total lifetime. So let's look at the exact lifetime gains that we can get with these new materials. Note that because the patent is in progress for these, we cannot reveal the materials exactly or the surface treatments that we are applying for this. What we can see for the standard nozzles is approximately 213 hours of lifetime. So this is about four to five weeks of usage with eight hour shifts, five days a week. For our 1500% improvement, we have over 3000 hours of usage. What this would equate to is hundreds of thousands of pounds of savings because the amount of downtime that you require for regular nozzle maintenance and nozzle replacements 
is far lower than for the standard nozzles. So what we instead get is less money spent, effectively less, less money wasted, due to process not being carried out during working hours. So we've analyzed the maximum light size that we can gain from our new materials and new surface treatments, but how do we measure wettability? For this case, we're using a high temperature contact angle goniometer. So what we can see here in the picture is a modified goniometer from a company called Data Physics. They have been conducting our contact angle measurements. The main difference between this and a standard goniometer is you will see that it has a heated chamber that also features nitrogen flow to inert the solder. The solder is deposited from a ceramic cannula and then flux can be applied to the surface of the solder in order to remove any oxides from it and to encourage it to spread out. We can then measure the contact angle of this solder and determine the difference of wettability from that contact angle comparing to the different materials that we have. So let's look at what happens in camera using this high temperature goniometer. So what you'll see in the video is the solder being deposited onto the surface of our material to be analyzed. The solder is SAC305. You'll see a uh, small amount of oxidized material on top of the solder. This is dealt with by application of our chosen flux, Activate. So once this flux is deposited on top of the material, this will remove any oxides and encourage the solder to spread out. And we can then capture a static image from this video feed and then calculate the contact angle using the software in the goniometer. So let's now look at what those droplet spreads look like. So what we have for droplet A is a much greater degree of spread and lower contact angle. So this is for our 1500% improved material compared to droplet B, which has a very low degree of wetting and a high contact angle. So you can see an instant improvement due to the change of material and surface modification that has occurred. So this will mean better wettability in process for selective soldering nozzle. So now let's move on to the technical summary for this presentation. As you can see, we've been able to determine a new methodology to analyze the wear of selective soldering nozzles that mimics real life selective solder nozzle usage. We've been able to determine some links between the wettability and wear and given some initial insights into the reactions and chemistry that underpins the wetting, wear, spreading of solder and possible formation of reaction layers and intermetallics. This is to be studied further, and there is currently a PhD project in progress looking at this. And finally, we've been able to determine new materials and new surface modifications in order to extend the lifetime and improve the wettability of these nozzles. So what does all this mean from a commercial point of view? So the improved wettability gives us multiple benefits, the first of which being once the nozzle is installed into a system and heated up appropriately, it can start instantaneously without the application of flux. So this allows you to more instantly begin your selective soldering process. And additionally, the surface modification allows for easier re-wetting of the nozzle. So you don't need to abrade the nozzle surface. You can simply apply a small amount of flux and it will regain wettability and regain control. The increase in lifetime is a massive increase in price to performance. There will be a slight increase in price for these nozzles, but you will get so much more lifetime from them compared to the standard nozzles. And finally, these nozzles are compatible with all solders and fluxes that are out there on the market. So you can simply drop these new nozzles into your system and you can proceed with your soldering process. So our new nozzle, the AP Master Nozzle, is currently in production and will be available for sale in June of this year. It is only available for Pillar House International Selective Soldering Machines. So please consider us if you want these increases in nozzle performance. And finally, I'd like to thank Innovate UK for the funding for this knowledge transfer partnership. I'd like to thank my colleagues at Pillar House International and Coventry University for their help in getting the work to this stage so quickly. I'd like to thank Norbert Heil from Data Physics for conducting the high temperature contact angle measurements and finally, Robert Cartmail from Marks and Clark 
for his assistance with determining how we would patent this material and proceeding with the patent process. So thank you very much for listening.